Let's talk racing. I've got Al Pierce and Matt Hall and myself, Roger Frank, running live. And we already have CJ Fajan on the line. How you doing tonight, CJ? Doing pretty good. How are you? We're all hanging in there so far, waiting on Christmas. Hello, CJ. K and N driver. Give us a little background, CJ. Oh well, I've pretty much raced anything with wheels on it since I was four years old when I got started in racing. And um, here recently, the past four years, I've been racing um, in the K and N series and um, made a lot of truck starts and uh, tested a couple of nationwide cars and uh, having a lot of fun doing that. And but uh, my whole life, I've mostly ran dirt until uh, I guess about six years ago when I made the switch to asphalt and, you know, ran in the NASCAR divisions and been having a lot of fun ever since. Um, what are you running in, what did you run on dirt? Give us a little dirt background. Sure, well, I'm, the only thing I haven't driven on dirt is um, a sprint car, a 410 sprint car. Everything else I've pretty much driven, uh, dirt modified, late models, um, micro, midgets, I mean, anything that, anything that's got four tires in your own dirt track, I've pretty much hit it so far, so. Um, my favorite so far is definitely the dirt late models and modified. Those are uh, definitely my favorite for sure. When um, and and what now? I, I got a little background on on what you're going to do this year. You want to talk about what's coming up for 2015? Yeah, I talked about that. Yeah. Fill us in. <laughs> well, it's a uh, it's pretty cool deal we got. I'm I'm living back here in Delaware now. And um, I kind of took this year off as a, a way to start building my dirt team. And uh, over the past summer and, and winter months now, I've been uh, building a dirt weight model brand new and a brand new modified for the uh, 2015 season um, to run on a limited to full-time schedule depending on um, what happens with, uh, you know, our NASCAR deal for uh, 2015. So. Um, it's kind of all dependent on that, you know, if we get a ride uh, for the 2015 season in the NASCAR series, then uh, obviously my dirt program will have to go to part-time, but if not, I'm going to rent that uh, full-time. So uh, we've got a 5,000 square foot shop down in Laurel, Delaware, and um, I've got uh, three race cars in there right now. So we're just, uh, we're excited. Uh, and the cool thing is I've always loved dirt racing. Uh, just, I've always been passionate about it, and it's kind of like, I guess, Tony Stewart going back and racing dirt. Um, it, it's something that you can never walk away from, that's for sure. Yeah, always fun to go back to kind of grassroots racing, as they're calling it now. Yeah, I mean, that's what got me started in racing. I raced go-karts off dirt, and um, like I said, up until about six years ago, I've, I've never touched asphalt, not one time. And uh, it was like... A huge learning curve for me, but um, you know, every time I get back in a dirt car now, it just you know, it feels like home and, and it's very relaxing, and I'm, I'm very comfortable in those cars. What are you looking to do in NASCAR this year? Um, I, I, you said you were you you've got some prospects coming along. What, what are you looking to do? Yeah, we've got a couple uh, a couple of deals that um, might come through. Uh, we're looking to mainly run um, either a full to limited schedule in the Xfinity Series for 2015, um, you know, all depending on sponsorship. And, um, you know, I would love for that to go through. It would be uh, it'll, it'll be something great to add to my resume. And I know that we can go in that series and win races with this team. And uh, I, I, the only thing, that, um, only thing that, you know, drivers depend on these days is, is sponsorship. So, um, you know, that's what we're kind of teetering on right now. And, um just hoping it goes through, you know what I mean? And if it's meant to be, uh, then, you know, we'll be there. And if not, then, you know, we'll, we'll have some fun dirt racing this year. Go ahead. You, you mentioned you started racing when you were age four. How, how does a kid at age four know he wants to get in a, in a motorized vehicle? Uh, a crazy story, actually. Um, my father, Ron, he raced dirt cars. Um, for a lot of his life, and uh, we were in the race shop one day, and it, as weird as it is, we talked about this all the time, I looked at my dad, he was working on the race car, I'm like, Dad, I want, I want to race, just like you, and he said, all right, he didn't ask any questions, um, didn't even bat an eye at it, he sold every piece of his racing equipment, every race car he had, every motor, everything, and uh, that's when we started racing go-karts at Fiddleport Speedway at the age of four, and um, to be quite honestly, I had no idea what I was doing out there, like in the practice session. And then the heat race came along, and uh, I was doing pretty well. You know, I think I started, I don't know, 
fourth or fifth, and I finished fourth or something like that. And then by the time the feature came around, um, you know, a light switch hit, man, and I, I won my first race ever. And it's uh, it's been uphill ever since then. And I can't commend my dad enough for giving me an opportunity um, just at the drop of the hat. I mean, he did never question it one time, never has in my whole career of like, are you sure you want to do this or anything like that? He's just he's been gung ho and been my biggest supporter. At at that age, though, are are you too stupid to be scared? I mean, do you, at that age, do you not realize what can happen? I, to be honest with you, um, I never realized what could happen until about 2012 when I took that real nasty wreck at New Hampshire in the k and series. Um, until that point, I really lit, like, I would push the car ten times harder than anyone else would, and I had no respect for the race car. Um... I wouldn't tear equipment up, but if there was a spot, I was going to take it. And not that I'm a hesitant driver now, but um, now that I realize, you know, just how bad things can turn out like it did in New Hampshire, um, it puts things into a whole new perspective and puts a whole new spin on it because in dirt racing, um, it's very dangerous, especially in open wheel racing like I've done my whole life. You know, one, I, I've, taken, I've taken a, a lot of flips and hits in dirt cars, but... Um, you know, that one asphalt wreck, man, it, it, it totally put things in perspective of just how crazy of a job I have. You know what I mean? It's, it's a, I don't know, it kind of fills you in on life. Did, did it slow you down any? Or just make you smarter? No, 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 it didn't slow me down. Uh, if anything, it really uh, kind of made me mad. Um, I wrecked at New Hampshire. I got, I got wrecked at New Hampshire. And um, I had a severe concussion, um, fractured foot. And I was sore all over, and uh, seven days later, I had to race up at Dover. So I had to be transported to the hospital after that wreck. They released me that uh, following morning, and when I got out of the hospital, um, I went down uh, back to Delaware and saw a uh, neurologist, or uh, I forget who I saw down here, but they had to clear me to race. And when the guy told me, he's like, you might, you may not be able to race at Dover if I can't clear you and you're not better. And at that point in time, it, I was so infuriated, I, I couldn't even think straight. Because somebody was telling me I couldn't race because of a medical condition and stuff like that. That It was really frustrating, but it motivated me to listen to the doctors so I could heal faster, so I could get back in the race car and do what I love. And, um, you know, it didn't slow me down at all. If anything, it motivated me to um, be smarter about my craft, you know what I mean, and, and realize that, you know, some things can't happen like that. You don't realize that it can't happen until it does, and it's an eye-opener for you. At, at what point in your career did you look far enough ahead to see this as a career instead of just as a, a hobby? Um. To be honest with you, I think it was when I was four, when I won my first race, I mean, I was already hooked. But um, there was a moment where my dad and I, um, you know, we got to uh, the next level, so to speak. Like, we were racing dirt cars, and, you know, we started making our way up and up and up. And each level, you feel like, you know, that's like, wow, you know, if we go any further than this, and this is, that will be awesome. But, you know, we're, we're happy where we're at, but we're going to keep pushing forward. And you don't really ever think that you can make it to the next level until you have that opportunity to do so. And um, I've been very blessed and fortunate enough to have those opportunities um, presented to me, and I've taken advantage of them. And, um, you know, the sky's the limit in anything that you do. I've always told everybody that. But, um, you know, you're racing in asphalt late models, and I was like, man, I, you, you, that's all I thought. That, that's as high as I thought I could go at the time. And um, I just my, just kept proving to myself that I could do it, and um, to my sponsor and to my teams, and uh, they believed in me, and that, that was half the battle right there. And, and how old are you now? I'm 21. Okay, so you've been doing it a long time yeah. already. <laughs> Very long time. Okay, yeah. okay. Do you have my, my last question, and I'll turn yeah, it back yeah. over. Do you, yeah, do, you, do you have a really? do you have a timetable or a schedule, or do you have something mapped out? It says by 23 I want to be here, by 25 I want to be there, by 29 I want to be doing this. Is it is it mapped out or is it just whatever happens happens? Well, there's two 
ways to look at it in life, and, and one of my ways is um, I've got certain goals in life that I want to accomplish and um, by certain ages, and it's kind of, if that's what you mean, then I, I guess, yes, my life is mapped out pretty well. Um, you know, there's no real set timetable with racing because, you know, sponsorship is never guaranteed, and, you know, tomorrow is never guaranteed either, but when you look at it in the perspective of, I guess, um, how about put this? When you look at it in the perspective of a positive outlook, you know, you do want to have your whole career mapped out. Like, I would love to be racing and stressed up by 23 and, um, you know, just have that life. But I understand that uh, there's circumstances out there that are going to prevent me. But um, I don't think I'll ever quit trying. I'll never quit racing, that's for sure. And, um, you know, I don't really think age is a limit on anything. I think, um, you know, the whole fad of a younger generation has definitely hit NASCAR. And um, you'll see a change. So I think there'll be a lot of younger drivers, and I'm just hoping you get one of those opportunities. Right. He, uh, and, and I don't want it to sound bad way, but the way the trend is now, he's almost too old. Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah, you kind of getting in that in that gray area of being, you know, you need you need something to happen in the next two or three years, I would think. Yeah, and, that, and that's it. Like uh, a lot of teams these days, um, obviously, uh, are only taking drivers that bring sponsorship to the table, and, and that's what's kind of frustrating me about the sport. Is uh, the drive? I'm, I'm not bashing any of the drivers out there. Don't don't get me wrong, but 95 to 96 percent of the drivers out there are family backed money. Um, there's no true sponsorship, so to say, you know what I mean. And uh, it's frustrating to see that in the sport. And um, but you know what? There's really nothing you can do about it. All you can do is searching for that one sponsor who believes in you and. You give them a marketing deck that they just can't refuse and uh, show them that you can, you know, give them a return on their investment and it's all gravy from there. Kind of like Daryl Wallace, you know, he's he's a very talented driver and, you know. Well, but Daryl Wallace has an advantage that this young man doesn't have. Well, I, I understand that, but but still, he's, he's you know, there's no sponsor, he, so he's going he's be, gonna to be leaving Gibbs, you know. Yeah, but he's, he's still got a ride, though, yeah. yeah. And, and if he... If he needed a ride, NASCAR would find him a ride. Yeah, I, I bet they Because they, they want him. They yeah, want him yeah. desperately. So. Yeah. So. Um, keep him in the sport, you know. Um, CJ, um, um, what kind of, um, where are you going to run your dirt car at? Are you going to do World of Outlaws? Are you going to do the Unlimited? Um, or the Fast Track Series? Um, what are you going to do? To be honest with you, I think we're, uh, I told most of my team, I think we're just going to do like some hit and miss or hit and miss races. Um, you know, we might hit a World Outlaw race and a Lucas race here. Uh, you know, then we might go down to Clary Motor Speedway and hit one of their local Saturday night tracks, you know, and um, just have fun. My biggest thing this year is to have fun. Um, I really, I've always had fun racing, but um, when you put that aspect back into it, um, you want to go out there and win races, obviously, but, um, you know, you don't have all the pressures of a sponsorship behind you and whatnot, so... Uh, dirt racing is just a lot of fun in that aspect where you can just go, you can be yourself, uh, you can go the track to the track, race, and come back all within, you know, one day. So, um, like I said, we're going to hit and miss on some racing, and we're going to come out with a schedule pretty soon and uh, just see what we can do with it. Are you, are you going to come down to VMS this year? I thought about that, actually. That's one of the tracks on, you know, my mental map there that, try and get on the schedule and, and see if we can race there. I mean, I, I've often hovered a uh, good friend of mine. He raced there um, for, I think, two or three years, and he loved the track and still goes back there and races. So we might partner up with him one weekend and go down there and have some fun together. Yeah, it's a good track, and it's, and it's a fun place to go race. They, they know how to do it down there. Yeah, that's for sure. They know how to promote it, too. I mean, that's that's one thing I can commend a lot of uh, these dirt tracks. Uh, they're really having to step up their game and promoting um, <laughs> because, you know, of the economy and whatnot. And, uh, you know, you take Charlotte Motor Speedway, for example, when they try to have that dirt race in Charlotte. I mean, they promote they promote it so much, and, and it works. So a lot of other uh, local tracks are taking note of what they're doing and duplicating it and uh, turning into some positive results for everybody. They got, they got a little bit of a... An advantage of VMS, though. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a Bill Sawyer track, so. Um, oh, yeah. That's for sure. It's a nice one. 
we're about ready to, to let you go here. I'm, I'm waiting for Doc to look out from behind that thing and and, and say we're we're about done. Whenever you're ready, then we'll have to get Monty on here. Oh, okay. Um, give us a little list of your sponsors for this year, and uh, um, we're going to let you get off here and, and get back to doing what you're doing. Sounds good, yeah. Um, well, this year we've got a couple new ones out on board. Uh, we've got Delaware Auto Exchange. Uh, Little Caesars are back on board again. Uh, they've always supported me through pretty much everything. Uh, my company, Real Eyewear, uh, we're going to be doing a lot with racing this year. And um, one CW Wrestling, that's actually a wrestling company up here in Delaware that is uh, a pretty big one on TV. And uh, we're good friends with them. So we're, uh, we're working out some deals to co-brand with um, some different type of venues, not just businesses. You know, we're, not, um, we're just trying different avenues and it seems to be working for us. And uh, we've got a couple other ones that are uh, knocking on the door, like Carl oh, Deputy and Son will probably come back on board with us. So just want to thank everybody that's ever helped me in my past. And... Uh, um, everybody's going to help me in the future because it's going to be a good, it's going to be a good road. It's not going to be short, that's for sure. Well, good. And good luck, and uh, hopefully we get to see you this summer. Yeah, thank you. Hopefully I get to see you guys, too, and uh, I'll bring you off and we'll see this pizza. Sounds yes. good to me. Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I have to do that, then. All righty, man. Well, you take care, and uh, Merry Christmas, and Happy New Year to you and your family, and uh, we'll see you next year. Yeah, sounds good. Well, uh, y'all have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and be glad to be back home whenever y'all want. All righty. We'll see you then. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. It seems like everybody starts when they're like four years old <laughs> or five years old or they're, you know, their racing is in grade school. And I guess nobody starts when they're 15 or 16 anymore. If you, no. do, your, if you do your past, they've, you're behind. You're 50 years old. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I don't want that to sound bad, but, you know, look at some of the guys that, you know, Keselowski's didn't start until they were later in life. Well, he was still, he was a teenager, I think. He was a teenager, both of them. Yeah. Brian didn't start until he was like 19. Well, and you'll see where he got him. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Logano started early. I mean, you know, the Bush brothers started early. You know, everybody starts as go-karts and... Yeah, you know, I heard we had somebody on the program a couple of three times the past few years, and they took they throw out this incredible number of how many go kart races they had won. You know, won twelve hundred go kart races one year, and I didn't say anything, but I thought, you know, I don't know about that. You know, you might run twelve hundred in your career. You know, you may have won three races on one night, in a in a you know, heat race and two semi-mains and a main, but you didn't win 1,200 races in a season. There's not 1,200 races in a, in a year, you know, that you could I, I, and physically I, make it to. I still I still say, bless his soul, bless his departed soul. I can't believe Dick Trickle's career numbers because if you, if you, if you divide the number of races he claimed he won when he first got to Cup, because once he got to Cup, he didn't win hardly anything after that. And you divide the number of years he raced in Wisconsin into the number of wins he claimed he had, won, he had it'd be like 70 a year for, for 12 years in a row. Well, well okay, and, and, and that's a fair acclamation. you got to remember up there, they still race five, well, six times. Well, five, five times a, a week. week. Okay, you, you and know. they started, and they started mid March on, I mean mid April to early May, and they quit in September. You, and, you're averaging seventy wins a year for twelve years. I just found it, and, and if you asked at the time, if you had asked him, he'd say, "Oh hell, I don't know. That's just a number somebody came up with." He said, "I want a bunch, but I don't know if that's right or not." So. But anyway, I you know numbers are it's like it's like the attendance at, at races. Charlotte Motor Speedway for years said they had more people in in the place than they had room for in field and grandstand. And you look up and a There's quarter a seats. quarter of the seats are empty anyway. Yeah. So and they're in Texas is great at that. Eddie Gossage is great at talking about how many people they had 
and, and then you talk to somebody who was actually there, and they say, you know, they covered up, you know, a bunch of seats down here and a bunch of seats over there. They took out all the backstretch seats. Their infield's not that big, but, you know, NASCAR lived with that lie for so long. And the reason they did it was, back when NASCAR was really, was really beginning to get going, they were in competition with minor league baseball in all these little southern towns. In Newport News, in Norfolk, in Richmond, every racetrack wanted the newspaper and the local people to think they drew more fans than the local baseball team. And they just threw out numbers. Well, we had 3,800 Saturday night. Eh, I don't know about that. So. But anyway. Do, do you think... And, and I'm not going to talk about racing, but or, or NASCAR, <laughs> but racing in general. Does it need a boost? Do you think it is strong, like it was no, in, in the '80s and the '90s? Well, do you think it needs a boost? Is there something that 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 all these series need to do that that kind of say we're the thing to go to? Well, you've got to you. What you've got to do is you've got to decide whether you want to be like every other sport and try to gain mainstream acceptance or do you want to set your own path and do your own thing and realize that people who live in downtown New York and downtown Chicago and people who live in LA and people who live in San Francisco, they care about teams that have their city's name on it. They care about the Jets. They care about the Yankees, they care about the Red Sox, they care about, about sports entities that they can relate to because that's my team. The Yankees are my team or the Mets are my team because I live in New York. There's no home team for racing. Charlotte, sort of, but you, you've got to get a lot of people to don't, they don't follow racing as much as they follow individual drivers. And I think, I think you need to market your drivers. Racing is the only sport when they introduce their, their competitors at the beginning of an event, they say, from Vallejo, California, Jeff Gordon. From Kannapolis, North Carolina, Taylor Hernandez Jr. When, they, when the Super Bowl players are introduced, <laughs> they don't tell you where they're from. It's their college. They might tell you their college. They yeah, it's their college. You. But when baseball but teams are announced and they've got on the field, they don't tell you where they're from. I think racing needs, and I'm, I think they're working toward it, I think racing needs to get their drivers more back in touch with their hometown people. The Bush brothers have, have, the Bush brothers have got to attract more of the of the the citizens of Las Vegas, not the visitors, not the tourists, not the gamblers. They need for Las Vegas to follow them, like New York people follow the, the Yankees. Yankees. Yeah, and and I think Casey Kane's from near Seattle. They need to get Casey Kane and the Seattle audience to kind of come together and, and have Seattle people watching Daytona because Casey Kane's from Seattle and Greg Biffle's from also Washington State and they're our two guys. And until they do that, I don't, I don't know that the average fan, the average mainstream sports fan is going to follow racing like they do everything else. But do you, do you think that the, the racing series need to do that or is that something that the driver needs to do? No, no, the, the, series, the to... series and the teams need to do it the drivers, they are so stretched now. They are so pulled in every direction for press interviews and shooting commercials and testing and trying to find a, a week's vacation somewhere. They, they, I don't think they can do it. They need to sanction anybody to do it for them. Um, you know, for example, the, the, the Auburn, I'm sorry, the Alabama-Missouri uh, game the other night for the SEC championship, got incredible ratings in Alabama, incredible ratings in Missouri, and really good ratings everywhere else. Well, Alabama's kind of a, of a, of a kind of a national team. 
Notre Dame's a national team. There are no race drivers except Junior who are national drivers. And I think they need to do that. They need to, they need to promote their drivers more in, in, with, the, with the regions that they are from. Jimmy Johnson's from the San Diego area. Jeff Gordon's from the middle of California. The Bush boys are from Vegas. No, Biffle and Kane are from, or from uh, uh, up Washington State area. Um, Kieslowski is from the Midwest, Michigan, Michigan. Michigan area, yeah. Um, Clint Boyer, Kansas. Boyer from Kansas. Jamie Legato from, from New Missouri. England. Legato's so, from New England. You know, you get Monty in all of this here. Who? Monty. Well, push the button. Oh, shoot, I'm going to screw something up. You there, Monty? Yep. Hey, I'm sitting here with Alan. We're just going over. I, I don't know. We're just running our miles, actually. Hey, Monty, how you doing? I don't know. How things in Clinton? Uh, pretty good. Uh, I've been, uh, I've actually been, I really don't know, I've been pretty much a recluse for the last couple of days. I've been editing because uh, I'm trying to put together a collection of short stories. And so I don't really, I, and actually the Chronicle's in my mailbox, I had no God. But I'm not, can't really tell you a lot, but I'm sure a lot of listeners probably don't care as much as you and I do about what's going on in Clinton. Well, I understand that. Let me say one quick thing about Clinton and PC. As you well know, they had their first winning season this year in a long time, six and five. I got to thinking the other day when they called to ask me for money, they lost to Ole Miss at the time a top ten national team. They lost to NC State at a time when State was pretty good and their State still got a bowl bid. They lost to Northern Illinois at a time when Northern Illinois was pretty good. They finished, I think, 11 and two maybe won the MAC or the, the Mid-America Conference and got a bowl bid. And they lost to Coastal Carolina, who was in, I guess, the one AA Final Four. So four of their five losses were to pretty good people. Well, so, they also lost to Liberty. Well, right, which made the NCAA, which made the tournament. So they did not have a bad loss. They had some good wins. They beat your alma mater. They beat Western. And they beat Monmouth at homecoming, so things are looking up for the Blue Hose in, in Clinton, I hope, and um, I hope they can keep it up. Yeah, the PC football season was probably my favorite thing to happen this fall. Yeah, yeah. And then the other day you covered a Clemson game, basketball game, I see. Yes, yes, I, I did that for the Little Rock, Arkansas paper. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad to see you getting out and getting about some. Uh, we have, you and I have not talked, we've talked for years about many things. We have not talked since the Homestead finale. And I suspect that you have a somewhat different view of the chase and its um, outcome th than I do. But uh, I, I respect your opinion greatly. I've admired you for years. We've been friends a long time. Tell our listeners... Your your view of the chase, if you not ha if you have not already. Well, it's not that it's not a secret, <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, I, on the one hand, I think that Harvick winning the championship was uh, fitting. I think Harvick has had a career that that a, that a champion is it that uh, that he deserves to be on the list of NASCAR champions. I think the fact that he won the last two races was was exceptional. My biggest problem with it is is that it's just so contrived that I mean, like, okay, it, they came out all right. They got a good champion. They got the rest of the ending. But I mean, who finished second? Uh, Ryan Newman. who didn't want to race. Right. I understand. And, and so, so my problem is is that to me, one of the problems in the sport in general is that you drum up if you make everything. A classic. There's no such thing as a classic, and so uh, I think that it's not. I think it's 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 compartmentalized, and overall, I think the way that the I think I basically think that if the the best performance of the season wins the championship, that it is a coincidence, and I think that they came at it well and they had that. I still, if if you give me a choice. I would still take the 2011 chase between Tony Stewart and, and Carl Edwards, where those two slugged it out for 10 races, and 
you know, the champion was first. The champion was first and the runner-up was second. And they didn't have to make it where it was impossible to not be that way. Right, I understand, yeah. So, it, it, the other thing is that the third place guy in points this year only won one race and actually missed a race. So you, you, had, a, you had a deserving champion and maybe not so deserving runner-up and maybe a not so deserving third place guy and the fourth place guy won a whole bunch of races but had one bad one and um, you know Logano just had bad pit stop killed him. Danny, ha Danny Hamlin missed a race? Yeah, for a yeah. Season come down to California. The but the funny thing about it is, the ironic thing about that is that the guy who during the course of the season would have won eight or nine or ten races if it hadn't been for a whole lot of mistakes was Kevin Harvey. Yes, yeah. The fact of the matter is, that during the season, probably the most, the, the team that, that had the most uh, uh, key mistakes uh, during the course of the year, that had so many bad things, got, some of them were, you know, some of them were kick crew errors, some of them were driver errors, some of them were bad luck, like a tire going down or whatever. But the fact is, is that one mistake cost Joey Logano, but a number of them did not hurt Harvick. Now, that hasn't been said. I don't have any qualms with Harvick winning the championship. But I think what it really comes down to, Al, is, is just basically what you want out of sports. If you want excitement, well, it's guaranteed. If you want justice, I think it leaves a lot to be desired. And, uh, and I mean, you know, I, I just, I, I really get tired of sort of, uh, contrived analogies as well when they say that uh, Ryan Newman making it to the Final Four would be like uh, a 10 seed in the NCAA tournament. Well, in the NCAA tournament, people play each other one-on-one. -on -one. I really think it's just sort of crazy if, if you compare a sport where two teams play each other to a sport where there's 43 teams on the track at any given time. I think that, that, that First of all, auto racing is unique, but I think it's more comparable with something like a golf tournament. To me, the chase is like if they went to Augusta and, Ty and Rory McIlroy shot 64 in the first round and 16th place shot 73. At the end of that round, they, they make it where only 16 would advance and then they'd be even. And then after the next round, after the second round on Friday, they cut down to eight. On Saturday, and so on, on Saturday, there'd be four people that could win the Masters, and one of them would be 20 shots ahead of the other. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. I, I would have, wait, I, I'm going to interrupt you too, and I want to, you said something in there, but you were talking about consistency. Well, Ryan Newman had to have been that consistent to finish that well. Doesn't he deserve that chance, even though he didn't win any? Well, it would have been possible in every system that NASCAR has ever had. There hasn't been a champion that's never won a race, but there have been consistent performances throughout history. For instance, James Hilton was second in points three times, and James Hilton only won two races in his career. But you have to look at, now, this is kind of a weird consistency. If you look at the whole chase and look at Ryan Newman's average finish, it was when the finishes were, not the overall average. If you looked at those 10 races and you looked at his average finish, it wouldn't have been that good. But he, just as Kevin Harvick had the great timing to win a race when he had to, just as, as, as Brad Keselowski advanced for another round or win at Talladega, it wasn't really being consistent that got Newman at there. It was being consistent in the right race and based on what happened to other people. So, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't have anything against Ryan Newman. If you want to know the truth, given my short uh, view of this system, I was his biggest fan at Homestead. <laughs> oh, I think a lot of us were. <laughs> I, think, yeah, I think everybody was. A, a lot of us, Monty, were pulling for Gordon to win the race and Newman to finish ahead of the other three. It would have been even better if he'd been like, <laughs> they'd been 19th, 23rd, 30th, and 40th. That would have been even better. But, uh, a lot of folks were kind of hoping that somebody would win the race who was not a contender and that Newman would finish well enough to be the champion. 
Um, do you agree or do you not agree with Dale Jarrett's position that if a windless driver gets to Homestead, as Ryan Newman did, that he has to win that event to be the champion, just finishing ahead of three other guys will not do it. you got to finish ahead of everybody to be the champion. That's Jarrett's suggestion for the tweak, which I doubt will come, but is that a does that strike you as being okay? No, it strikes me as being making the world's most contrived system even more contrived. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Something is screwed up and really screwed my, up. My feeling is, is that you and I, we follow the sport and we understand how the system works, but I think what we don't realize when we're watching the races is that uh, there's a lot more people than most people, than most racing journalists who don't ever go on Twitter, who don't even read the stories we write, who just sit down in front of the TV. That doesn't mean they don't love racing. It just means that, well, it probably means they like to pay attention to the race instead of looking at all the silly little comments guys like me make during the race. But I think that, 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 every, I mean, that everybody gets, uh, uh, you know, if NASCAR has, I don't know, 35 million, 50 million fans, well, I don't believe there's anybody on Twitter covering NASCAR who has 35 million followers. I think it's more like 60,000 followers. And so I think we overstate those numbers in that effect. And I also think it contributes to people getting in their own little world. But one of the things, by the way, and this, I, I, I apologize for getting off the subject, but I want to get this in. Because one of the things that, that I thought about when the system changed, but I, but, but I think it's definitely true is that one of the biggest things that I heard, think has hurt the quality of the racing is what was universally praised when it first came out, which is all restarts being made with everyone in running order. People always say double file research, which is a, starts, which is a misnomer, because they were double file, but one line with people who were lapped down. All right, first of all, if you just look back out, you know, you're not both covering all those races at the time. It used to be really exciting when a guy who had a tire go down or a bad pit stop was on the inside and everybody was trying to keep him a lap down because he was going to win the race and he got back on and he raced his way. Dale Earnhardt was one of the most exciting people to watch in that situation, come through the pack. Well, when they made it where everybody was in running order and all the lap cars were at the back of the field, they made it impossible to race your way back on the lead lap. So the next step was, well, we'll, we'll have a, a free pass. And then it went from that to right in the race. If the if, if the leader doesn't, if the leader pits, then everybody's left down to not pit and wave around. And so you have the phenomenon now of a race that there's eight people on the lead lap at the halfway mark and 32 for the last 10 laps. It's hard to get a lap down and stay a lap down. Yeah, that's one of my favorite lines that anybody ever told me. And again, I've always never uh, passed on the identity, but. A fairly prominent, well, not, not, not that, a, a, a well known driver who's been around a long time and he's a guy that I kid around with. One time I, I walked up from behind him and I said, uh, You know, a man's got a race like hell to lose a lap nowadays. <laughs> and, he turned, and he turned around and he said, Yeah, you finally lose the SLB and they won't let you keep it. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite lines ever. Do you, do you agree with the uh, premise that? you should not be allowed in the chase without having won a race. If that, if that means you've only got a 10 driver chase, so be it. If you've got a 20 driver chase, so be it. But you've got to win to make the chase. That's one of the biggest, uh, watch what you ask for, you might just get it. There was a driver who won the championship named Tony Stewart who had no regular season victory and won five of the yeah, races. That's right, yeah. And so if you do that, you're eliminating the possibility of that ever happening again. And that's the most exciting thing I've seen, I probably saw in the 20 years I covered race. Yeah, and at Homestead, you know, everybody forgets at Homestead, they basically ended an entire season tied in points. And they finished 1-2 at that race, and uh, Tony beat him in, by wins, whatever it was to not as many, but uh, I guess five to five to whatever. And Edwards, you know, I think that might have been Carl Edwards' best chance. Well, it certainly was 
his best chance to ever win a championship, I think, right then. It was one point that separated them. No, they were tied. no, they ended up tied. Yeah. Were they tied? They were tied. Absolutely I'm, dead tied. That's the only way. Was it one, 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 one win? One win. Yeah, over. the tiebreaker yeah. went, went to went to Tony. Um, yeah. One more question about about the chase, Monty, and, and we'll get to something more pleasant, maybe. Um, I, I remember in January on the media tour when they announced the chase, the, this the new deal. Uh, Brian French stood up there, and Mike Helton, and, and Steve O'Donnell, everybody stood up there. And I don't remember ever hearing the word consistency mentioned. I never heard them say, we're going to take all the winners plus a bunch of other guys who are very consistent. They seemed very certain back in January that there would be 16 winners or more and that instead of adding winless drivers, they'd be bumping out winning drivers. Um, I thought that ridiculous at the time, and to me, I'm, I'm just going to chalk that up. And they didn't really believe that, but they were just overhyping it to death. Yeah. And I actually think that that was ludicrous. Because I don't know that, uh, you know, 16 winners in, in 26 races, that's asking a whole lot. Well, I think the all-time record for 30, uh, 30 plus races is 16 or 18 different winners, I think. And to think that there are going to be 16 different winners in 26 races, plus the fact that in this past season, now, you know, I probably used to need to, like, do some figuring, which, since I don't, you know, cover racing week to week, I'm not inclined to do. But it seems like to me that if you look at right now, compared to 10 years ago, that... There aren't as many upsets that there aren't. To me, it's almost impossible for someone who's not from the major multi-car teams to win a race. To me, the difference between, like, let's say, let's look back in the 90s. And if you look, you know, you might have a, you know, if you look at the level of people, say, at that time, Harry Gant, Jeff Bodine, uh, maybe, uh, Maybe Michael Krampus' his team, uh, other, others along of that line. It seems like to me that the distance between the very top team and the next level, I, I don't think, I think that the, dis, the difference between Brad Doherty and, and, and uh, Rick Hendrick is wider now than it was between, say, uh, Leo Jackson and Richard Childress in 1995. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's something that I have to admit, that's something that I just have the impression from experiencing the time back then. And so, there are a lot of times where you can get an impression which seems like that, and if you look at the numbers, it disproves it. But it's very difficult to analyze NASCAR statistically because there's so much difference. Because what I was talking a minute ago about wave around, and all these people who, 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 you know, I call it socialized racing. Well, you know, if you look at that, when everybody sits there, they always throw it in your face. They always say, well, back in 1992, Jeff Burton lapped the field, or Jeff Burton did that. could never happen. Of course it couldn't happen. Nobody would have lapped the field in 1978 if these rules had been in place back then. Well, I think that's because of the cars. I don't think that's because of, that's, I think the cars have helped take that out of it. I mean, I, you know, I was just sit, sitting here thinking Bill Elliott was two laps down at Talladega, made him back, and they went green to checkered. Wasn't that Talladega yeah, that he three, did Yeah, three laps, I believe. But, yeah, Monty, yeah. you were there. I was here that day when Elliott made up all those laps. But, um, yeah, I think it, at the very least, it was two and a half. Yeah. Actually, the truth of the matter is, is that while today we're sitting there, you know, when you were watching that, it was pretty breathtaking. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All right, let's get away from racing for a minute. Tell us about that. <laughs> no, 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 no. We, we, we beat this horse to now, death. Now, by the way, Carl Edwards won only two races that year in 2011. Okay, won two races this year also. Anyway, well, um, tell us about your latest book now. You, you you're, um, is it crazy by natural? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a, a brain fart here, Monty. But what, what's your latest novel called? 
I've got the latest one is called the intangibles. But I mean, I have two in the works that I've been editing and all that. So I, I have a I have a book called Crazy of Natural Causes. That's the one. Okay. Set in Kentucky, uh, and it has somewhat of a sort of religious theme to it, although it is not at all tame and it's not wholesome. But uh, then there's a crime novel that's called Forgive Us Our Trespasses that's involving a honest cop and a corrupt solicitor with political ambitions. But uh, uh, I'm actually sort of trying to find a better publisher and try to find myself back. I'm, I'm actually could have the book published now, but I'm not willing to, to, to go with it yet. So, okay, okay. But I mean, I've been working on a, a short... As you may know, I have a, a blog it's called Well Pilgrim at WordPress, mm -hmm. and, and I write short stories there. And so what I've been doing today, I just finished polishing up uh, uh, Crazy of Natural Causes, and so now I'm compiling a, short, a collection of short stories to enter a contest where they give you a publisher's contract, publishing contract, stuff like that. And so I've taken... 23 short stories that I've written in roughly the last year, and, to, and, I, and I've put them in the order and mixed in, you know, real long ones. I, there's one short story you can find at that site called How Wild and Handsome that is auto racing based, but others are sports and others are people who are out of work and everything else. So anyway, I'm kind of excited because I've been working on, on that uh, the last, th this week. And so, so uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, I, what do you do when you're a writer who has his job every day? Yeah. Well, you do what you know how to do. You keep on writing and try to make it best you can. Are you still in the NMPA? No, I am not. Okay. I was going to say, why don't you, I was going to invite you to bring your guitar and come to Charlotte next month, and if you wanted to, you could bunk in with me and uh, go to the NMPA dinner and go to the hospitality room afterward and play some, play some music for us. Well... I wouldn't mind doing that, but at the same time, I'm not looking to because I sort of think that part of my life is behind me. I'm still interested, but I said when uh, I said when I was sort of dispatched from my job of 20 years, I would I would go back to it when I was uh, getting paid to do so, and not just 50 bucks for a sidebar. So uh, I'm not averse to covering racing again, but I don't expect it to happen. Yeah, but your friends are still out there looking for you. So, you know, anytime you want to stop in, you know you're welcome. Well, I miss them. I miss everybody. I miss people with track. The hardest thing about writing about racing at home, first of all, is I used to like to, I, I, I don't like to depend on what TV chick decides to show me. But besides that, uh, the hardest thing is, is that, you know, I want to know what's the truth, whether I can print it or not. And I miss all of my contacts in the garage, the people that were not, you know, a fabricator here and a guy that's an engine builder there, but the guy that is right my ride and take me aside and tell me what's going on. And there's a lot of times where I just can't trip through the BS because I'm not there to talk to people that don't have any, have any stake in one side or the other. So, uh, uh, it even got hard at the end for me, and I was fairly, I didn't want to enjoy it much because... It's just so hard. It's the same thing. I was at some basketball game the other day. It's uh, the analogy I've always made is I hate to just deal. Right now, I just, you know, I read transcripts. First of all, I hate to not be able to see people when they're talking to me and look at their expressions. Mm -hmm. And I hate to have, not have access to people that I have over years felt were straight shooters and you learn which ones will feed you line and which ones you don't, but I don't like the fact that it's become journalism by press conference. There, there are times when you want to ask a question at a press conference because you want to make people have to make the decision of whether they're going to lie to a whole room of people because that's a little bit harder than lying to just me. And then there's some question that you don't want to ask in a press conference because you don't want to share it with the rest of the world. Of the world. Mm -hmm. There was a time when I was in Talladega in the aftermath of Dale Earnhardt's death, when I asked a question that a high-ranking NASCAR official inadvertently answered in a way that, that, that basically saying they had done something that they denied doing before. 
after it was over, one of my colleagues came running up to me about to cut me out and said, how come I didn't follow up? And I said, you damn fool, because I didn't want to let everybody in the room know what he just said. So all those considerations are out the window when you're not there. And so that's the value of being there, and that's the biggest thing I missed. Well, we miss you not being out there, because you're always... Um... I've known you for 50 some years and it's always fun to have you there, uh, listen to your opinions, listen to you play music and um, there ain't many there ain't many like Monty Dutton out there anymore. They're all they're all too buttoned down and too scared of being uh, getting their hard card lifted maybe. I don't know. Well, but, I think that one of the things that I may and I think this is true of you as well, Al, is it used to be when you covered racing, when you were a racing reporter, you invariably also got a taste of local short track racing. I used to go to Cherokee Speedway and Greenville Pickens a lot. And you got to know the racing at the grassroots level. I think, first of all, there are very few daily papers still covering the sport. And so everybody's assignment is only the, the top level. And I think that a lot of people have never, their idea of a great, uh, dirt track race is the truck series race at Eldora. And while that was very entertaining, dirt racing, they had to set up that track to be so uh, durable to hold all those heavy trucks that it's really, in some ways, it looks more like asphalt. And you don't really see that slide, that side, sideways sliding that you'd get if you were watching midgets or sprints mm -hmm. running at Eldora. And I think those are the only short track races some of these people have ever seen. And so I think that they lack that perspective. And, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was fortunate because I came up and I, I, I tried to specialize in auto racing because I'd followed it all my life. I remember seeing Fireball Roberts drive a flathead forward at the Greenwood, Greenwood Fairgrounds when I, was about, when I was, you know, four or five years old. And I, I went to Bristol in 1965 when I was seven and saw Ned Jarrett win. And I saw Richard Petty win on Greenville Pickens when it was still dirt. So I followed it all my life. But yet I was professionally trained as a journalist, and I carried those ethics, and I covered enough of other things that I sort of could, you know, compare. I still compare and contrast the way other sports are, you know. And so, uh, so I felt like that was something that, that, that gave me a little perspective because... I really don't think there's many people in race today who have really followed all their life and know all about it now. But I, I'll pay a little tribute. I've always thought that if I'd been in that situation, if I didn't know anything about racing and they assigned me to, that the first thing I would have done was done a lot of like library research. I'd start reading up on the history of the sport. The only person I know that, well, other than you were covering it before I was, but the only person I can tell you definitively who ever did that that I knew was David Poole. Mm -hmm. Because a little, little known to many people, David didn't really know that much about NASCAR when he first came on the beat, because I was on it before he was. <laughs> I was sitting here thinking the same thing. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so David, David was the guy who took his career seriously in that area. And uh, I, I've often wondered why more people did but he's the only one I ever know who did well, Monty, listen, we have enjoyed having you as always. You, you, the invitation stands if you want to come to Charlotte for that Sunday night of the NMPA dinner. Uh, be glad to have you stay in my room, share a, um, a room with me and bring your guitar and we can have a, we can have a good old time. Well, I thought that there might even be a couple people missing me now, so I don't know. Believe me, there are, and, and you need to come back and see everybody. So anyway... Thanks for calling in. Thanks for giving us your insight, your judgment, your honesty, which we don't get from a lot of folks. And um, the thing is, is you know, look, I don't know where I'm right, but see, I'm one of these guys where if you said that eighty percent of the people love the way it is right now, well, I would, my answer would be, but I just speak for me. I think you have to have a look. I think when you, I think part of what when you're a journalist. That part of what you give people is what they want, and part is what they need. And I think that you have to use the perspective that you gain. I mean, I covered the sport for 20 years. I didn't just, you know, flip a coin about what I liked and what I didn't. And so, 
you know, I, I'll, I think that I at least had the courage to, to uh, put, have the strength of conviction to call it the way I saw it. And, and you normally called it right? Well, I think that there's a lot more people out there who agree with me than is generally known because it seems like to me everything's in denial. Like, the minute, the minute they drop the green flag on anything new, they have a whole chorus of people screaming how wonderful it is. And, you know, the other analogy that I've always used, uh, one of it is determined by press conferences like entering the soil and water conservation essay contest when you're in the seventh grade. And the other thing is that uh, it, the emperor's new clothes, where the emperor's, the emperor's going down in a, in a, with naked, and everybody's saying, oh, I want those beautiful clothes, because everybody's in denial because they want to tell the emperor what he wants to hear. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, Monty, take care of yourself. Have a good holiday. Uh, take care of Clinton. Tell everybody down there I said hello. And uh, we will talk to you for sure next year. All right. Talk to you soon. Thank hey, you. Thanks, right. Monty. Thanks, Monty. He's right about a lot of stuff. Well, yeah. He knows a whole lot more than, than most people out there. I got a couple questions for you. All right. And, and I, we, we can kind of quick fire this. Good, because I'm hungry. <laughs> so am I. He's buying. I know he is. Where are we going, you know? The Chinese place. I need to go to the Chinese place tonight. I need, I need seafood. I need fish. You need Chinese shrimp. food? That's good. Um, COT cars. COT cars? The, the new cars. Cars of tomorrow or whatever I thought they're they were, I thought they were done. What, what are That's they now? The car tomorrow right there. Well, what are they now? I don't have any idea. I really don't. I know they're doing a little bit of tweaking. They're not doing a whole lot, I don't think, are they? I, I haven't heard. I don't think so. The only thing I heard today, and, and in a way it kind of upset me, they said that the NASCAR officials are not going to police the lug nuts, putting five lug nuts on. We already said something about that a long time ago. But they announced it today. I, I read it today. I know that. So, you, you know, technically, you know, they can, they can win a race with one lug nut on there. No, they, they, they will know. be policing because they will have video cameras that's going to be monitoring that. It's not the way that this this made it sound. They were not going to police it. Hall of Fame. All right. Um, your thoughts on who they? I, and I don't. Even, I know one, and that's Wendell Scott. I don't even. Yeah, know Wendell who Scott's either. going in. Bill Elliott's going in. Bill Elliott. Fred Lorenzen's going in. Joe Weatherly's going in, and Fred Lorenzen. Yep. And and I, I voted for all of them except one. I, di I didn't vote for Elliot. I didn't think, you know, it's his first time on the ballot. To me, you, you know, he's deserved. Yeah, yeah, but not the first not, time. Not right now. Yeah. There are other drivers out there who won more than one championship, who weren't as popular. But that's you know, um, you know, Bobby Isaac won a championship and won more races than Elliot. Bobby Ozzie didn't even get a scratch. Um, there are other guys who won more championships and uh, I think probably more races and didn't didn't get a look. But but you knew one to Scott was going to go in sooner rather than later because NASCAR wanted him to go in, and NASCAR corporately has more people on the voting panel, has enough people to carry whoever they want. Right. You know, they've got they've just you know. And a lot of them work virtually, for MRN. Virtually stuff the ballots. A lot of them, I don't stuff the ballot, but they work for MRN. They work for various speedways. They work in Daytona Beach. Uh, I don't know that NASCAR talks to those people every year on that morning in a little closet and says, okay, here's who you're going to vote for. But I think those people know by the way NASCAR presents the arguments up there. Okay, I, I kind of know who Brian wants in. I kind of know they want Wendell Scott in. That's very important to them to get him in. Uh, Fred Lorenzen's health is not good at all. Lorenzen may not even live long enough to get to the banquet in May. He's, his health is very bad. Joe Weatherly, two-time champion, killed on the racetrack. How do you not, I mean, how come he didn't go in before he did? Yeah, because he's given his all, as they would say. Yeah. Um, and again, Elliot probably could have waited another year or so. Um, All of them are deserving. It's just their, their timing. Yeah, it's yeah. timing. It's, I think Lorenzen, based on health, Wendell Scott, based on NASCAR's wishes to 
diversify. Um, Joe Weatherly, a two-time champion who died in in competition. Riverside. Um, no, Charlotte. Who's the other one? Yeah, Riverside. Riverside. Who's the other one I mentioned? I've already forgotten who the other one was. Bill Elliott, Joe Weatherly. Weatherly, Elliott, Lorenzo, Scott. Oh, and 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 um, Rex White. Rex White, yeah. Rex White got in. First first NASCAR champion. No, no, no. He was he was down the line of ways. The first one was um, Red Byron. He he's not in yet. And the second was Bill Rexford. He's not in yet. Bill Rexford, that's who so, I was trying to. I, I kinda wonder about about Rex White, although I think they wanted somebody from back in an era when Maybe the little guy could possibly do something. He didn't win all that many races, but he did win a championship by consistency. So, and he is alive. And I think the other thing is, they wanted people in the Hall of Fame who could go out and represent the Hall of Fame. They didn't want any more dead people in the yard who got in there. They wanted people who can who can promote the Hall of Fame. Weatherly certainly can't, and I don't think Lorenzen's able to. Uh, and Wendell Scott can't, but obviously Bill Elliott can can go out in the community, and uh, and Rex White can go out in the community and talk about it. Yeah, I've I've met one of the girls that works with the Hall of Fame, and she's told me anytime we wanted anybody that's still alive and kicking to call in to give her a shout. Too. Well, we'll see about that. Ask him to have Bill Elliott call in, see yeah. how far he gets. <laughs> um, Tell him we're going to talk about Chase. <laughs> they brought up El, um, Monty brought up Eldora, and that's always a great race, and I think that's probably one of the best races that the Truck Series really has, as far as competition level. No, people watching. Oh, I think that draws more than probably any other race. Yeah, it's midweek for the trucks. Nothing else going yeah. on. It's midweek. Are we going to see any other division of the top three on dirt? Where would you take them? You wouldn't. Would you take them there? Well, you know, you got Knoxville, and I hate to say it, VMS actually could handle them. I think VMS could handle them. Well, that's just another road course, though. No. Oh, you mean, you mean Bill? Oh, no. um, I don't I, think Bill would go for it, but uh, but NASCAR you get, you got to put up soft walls. You would think for that? Did oh, they yeah. have to do it at Eldora? Yeah, let's just take battery Eldora, don't they? No. You sure? Yeah, no. Yeah, okay, there's really? no soft walls. Yeah, because. When that was a concession to let them come in and run. Uh, when Kyle was out there bumping the wall, he, they weren't soft walls. It was tearing <laughs> no, up the truck no, every no. time yeah, they, they, they can take the walls down from Rockingham if they want to because they may never race there again. So, I don't know. But do you, do you think it's a possibility? Do you think NASCAR would look at that, running the cars? Either the, the in, Infinity Series? Of course, is that if, if, you, take, if you take another series Excellent. to Eldora... It sort of takes the uniqueness away from having the trucks there, right? You know, and then as soon as you take Nationwide there or Xfinity, then within three or four years they start screaming, "Well, we want a Cup race here." And I it just I don't know. I, I, must, I would say take the uh, Nationwide guys, guys out to Knoxville. It's a wide enough track. It's wide enough, and there and the facilities are there that, that can yeah. handle the crowd. But crowds. see, they've got they've got. You haven't been yet. Either. They've got New, Newton, Iowa's right there, close by. They gonna let them go there three times a year. It's two hours. They gonna go to they gonna go to Iowa three times. Why not? I don't know. How many times you go to a North Carolina? Well, it's a little bit different <laughs> population <laughs> base there. What do you what do you think about a couple of tracks already starting talking about pulling seats? Well, they just they put up too many to begin with. Rich, Richmond did, and Atlanta well, well, did, Dover, and I think Charlotte Dover, Dover did. did. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, Dover, I think it's Dover, a good idea. Dover had been taking them down and covering them up for years. Yeah, Charlotte hadn't used the backstretch for years. Richmond took seats down in turn three, so they just they thought the Golden Goose was going to be laying golden eggs forever. What you, would you think about, uh, I heard some rumbling about the restart rule on the, for next year, the restart. I didn't know they changed it. Uh, apparently it's going to allow them to be a little bit more uh, rough. It's, it's, let, me, let me see if I can pull that yeah, out. Yeah, but don't do it long. I'm, I'm hungry. I gotta, I'm hungry. <laughs>
Well, we can talk um, about it at, at supper. No, just tell me what you think they're going to do, and let me see. Well, uh, well, no, well, no, no, let's talk Al Pierce here. What, what do you got coming up? We got any more books coming out? No, 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 I'm done with that. I want to read your Holman and Moody book. Why don't we go buy one? <laughs> Gee, thanks. You got any? I do not, in fact. You got how many? Three books? I got 14. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Hold on here. I'm, I'm, somebody just <laughs> asked me an important question. <laughs> where are you going to eat? <laughs> uh, no, I know where we're going to eat. But what does it say there, PC doctor? I'm trying to get to it. I had forwarded on to be posted on Facebook. Let me see if I can Well, if, you're going, if you go by Facebook, once you go by real NASCAR... No, I mean, I had posted you. the article to Facebook. That's what I was trying to find. I'm actually still trying to find it on my news feed. On are my you phone. on Facebook? I try not to be. <laughs> um, auto week, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. How's that going? Doing good. You're paying me every now and then. Every now and then. <laughs> and I'm, I'm working every now and then. You going to races this year? Oh, of course. Of course. Where's your favorite place to go? Martinsville. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You see everything. You, you just... 500 laps of absolute chaos. Even more so than Bristol. Bristol's too quick. I think Martinsville being slower, they, they're a little bit more... They don't mind leaning on each other at Martinsville. Well, it's a lot flatter. You can get away with a lot more, I think, at, at Martinsville than you can at Bristol. All right, you can't find it. Let's do it next week. Yep. I, I'm going to find it in about 10 seconds. All right, Nine, I'm giving you ten seconds. Eight. <laughs> oh shit, it's just right there. Rule changes on restart. Well, it could have been packed. Well, of course it could. But then again, anything could have. Could create rowdier restarts. Must be because they're taking down the the power in the cars again. I don't think that's going to last very long. I, I, yeah, they're going to go from 900 to 700 horsepower, but these engineers are going to figure out how to how to step it up pretty quick. Well, I can't. Well, what does it say? I can't read that little type. It, it says that the NASCAR's reduction of horsepower and downforce might have its biggest impact, so it's going to be on the restarts. <clears throat> I think the only place that, that the horsepower is actually going to really going to show a difference is at your big trucks, your Daytonas and your Talladegas. That's just my opinion. Yeah, I'll read it when I get home. Okay, you do that. <laughs> Catch everybody next week on Let's Talk Racing. See ya!